So we've got Jeff and Joshua on our panel this afternoon. Um, Logan had to shoot out to do another important thing. He's hoping to get back. We might have him later on. Um, but for now, it's just the three of us and these questions, good quality questions that have been submitted um, throughout the day. So thanks for doing that. Um, just a quick question to help us get to know you guys. Um, we've heard you uh, preaching and teaching uh, from the Bible and about these things that you've shared with us today. Um, and it's it's gone really well. But we'd love to know a story of when it didn't go well. What's your worst um, experience in preaching that you've ever had? Uh, Joshua, can you start us off with that? Um, are these on? Is that, is that working are, here? Yeah. Uh, the, the worst preaching experience. Um, I, I think there was one occasion where uh, I was, uh, there was some particular topic that I was, I was asked to speak on. And um, I, I remember having met this woman uh, for the pastoral meeting earlier on in the week, and I knew some terrible struggles that she was going through. And she turned up on Sunday uh, in the morning, and I was preaching the sermon, which going through Luke, you don't really get to you know, consecutive expository preaching. You don't mm. get to choose which ones you're going to skip over, <laughs> given your, your audience. Uh, and it, it was, I wouldn't say a hellfire and brimstone sermon, but it was a pretty painful sermon um, on the nature of God's judgment and wrath against sin. You know, you're speaking this and, and you're, you're just seeing her face and you're just like, oh, you know, this, this is not the sermon I would have chosen to mm -hmm. deliver knowing that she was there. And yet afterwards, I mean, I guess this is a testimony um, of the what we've just been talking about. Afterwards, she was very thankful. And that's not because of my preaching. That's because the spirit works and moves as he wills. And so we need mm -hmm. to trust in him. Um, but yeah, that was that was a pretty hard sermon to preach, mm. you know, seeing her face and going, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that's tough. How about you, Jeff? Any did Well, um, <clears throat> apart from using the bathrooms with the lapel mic still on, <laughs> when the sound desk was unattended, um, forgetting my sermon notes a, a, a number of on a number of occasions. Um, I, I did have a unique experience once. I was visiting a church, and at the start of the service, I thought, you know, just go around and meet some people. And I sat down next to a guy. I said, I put out my hand. I said, hi, I'm Jeff. And he leapt away from me, and he said, don't touch me. I'm God. And I was like, oh, okay. We, um, interesting. So, so, but then I had to stand up and preach. And I had this very, it's a very unnerving sort of weird experience of, preaching to somebody who I knew was sitting right in front of me who believed that they were God. Mm -hmm. um, it was obviously a psychosis that they were going through, but they believed they were God. So I'm thinking, if if I was God and I was listening to the sermon, how would I be <laughs> taking this? Uh, so that was that was a, quite a challenge, actually, for that. Um, it ended up with the police being called and everything, but um, it was, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, Wow. I just said, oh, I'm Jeff. So, yeah. I didn't say nice to meet you, God. I just said, I'm Jeff. So, yeah. Man, wow. Thanks for sharing those stories. We're going to launch into the uh, real solid theological questions now. Got one here that I received earlier, and that is why did God make wasps? I mean, bees make honey, bumblebees are cute and fluffy. What are wasps good for? <laughs> Got any answers there? Um, wasp, yeah. So just just by the way, just so you know, um, this is not a. We don't know the answers to all questions. So <laughs> if we say pass, that's totally fine. Uh, if we don't know the answer, uh, why did God make wasps? Well, I I believe first of all in the sovereignty of God that He makes everything with a purpose and a reason. What I know about wasps is that they are predators and carnivores. And um, they eat things. Uh, my experience of growing up on a farm, so part of the food chain. Um, but yeah, German wasps in New Zealand don't like that idea. Um, <laughs> that's so that's that's to me is evidence of the fall as well. So fair. I, I would simply say for his glory. Isn't that what we profess? That all things are made for the glory of God. Cool. 
I don't know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> no, good, good attempts, good answers. That's great. How about here's one I know you can definitely answer. I'd love to know. We'd all love to know about your uh, journey to the Reformed faith. You've you've both um, shared these truths that are obviously very important to you. Mm. So, were you just born with the five solas like tattooed to the insides of your eyelids, or how how did you come come to be passionate about these things? Joshua, could you kick us off with uh, your your story there? Um, yeah. And if you could please um, use the yeah, microphone, speak up. I'm just thinking. We've got some people online who are wanting to hear your answer as well. Um, it, uh, look, that's a good question. I, I grew up in the Reformed faith. I didn't know a time when uh, mm. I wasn't taught it. Uh, my mm -hmm. father was a minister. Not Richard Flynn, but Michael Flynn. Uh, and yeah, as, as far as I can remember, I was able to get answers to the difficult questions theologically. Mm, yeah. and it was a real blessing to grow up in that environment. Mm, praise God. I, I don't think for me the issue was so much a lack of training in uh, what the scriptures teach, the great matters of doctrine. Although, I mean, there's always more for us to learn and I don't profess to be an expert. I think the issue for me was the opposite side of the spectrum that I realized when I was probably in my mid-20s uh, that as much as I had been raised to know these truths and to to to, to be soaked in them regularly, uh, my faith was not really one of joy. Mm. Um, that they they hadn't penetrated to the level of my heart where I actually delighted in the things of God. I knew them, um, and I would tell people about them, and yet uh, at the end of the day, for me to turn around and go. You know, I'm just an awe of my God. That was something which came much later in life. Mm. And it actually came through a chance conversation I overheard. There were two people we were going up to a, uh, a kayaking school camp. I was the teacher that came along. It was a Christian organization that was doing it. Uh, and there was a guy and a girl that became apparent they were Christians, but he simply asked her in the front of the car, and I overheard this, uh, you know, what? what's one way in which your grandparents have just been used by God in your life to really draw you closer to him. Mm. And I thought, I've never had a conversation like this in my 25 years of, of life. Um, and that's, that's not to undermine the blessing that my parents were, but to recognize that truth is not an end unto itself, but it's an end towards the intimate knowledge and love of our God and being able to experience that both now and in the life to come. Mm. And I think that was one of the times that the Spirit made great strides in my life, and I give him all the glory for that. So, yeah, the, the other end of the spectrum was my problem. Mm. That's, yeah, praise God for doing that work. How about you, Jeff? I, I'm, I'm very similar. I grew up in a, in a Reformed church, so we learned the Westminster Shorter Catechism, wherein consists the sinfulness of that estate where into man fell. I mean, so we learn about original sin and all those kinds of questions. So I, I accepted the sovereignty of God, the total uh, the depravity of man, of uh, limited atonement, um, you know, of irresistible grace, um, those, the tulip. Um, but I think, it, it, likewise, my I had to come to a personal mm. appreciation of that and what... Um, I, I experienced the practical outworking, or the yeah, the, the practical outworking of irresistible grace. Mm, mm. So my plan for my life was to enjoy my life, to live it up, party, uh, to make the most of, you know, drugs and alcohol and all that kind of stuff. And I was sort of already set in that way when I was a teenager, and um, <clears throat> and then maybe when I was pretty old, like about 50, something like that. And, you know, because then pretty much your life is over anyway and it's all boring and downhill. Um, then I would probably consider becoming a Christian. Mm. Uh, just just like as Joshua said before, just to be on the safe side. Um, and But at 18, God began to do things. Um, he began to hunt me down like the hound of heaven and used incredible you know used songs and nightclubs highway to hell he used my me and my stoned mates in a car you know conversations mm. i overheard to just 
draw me, drag me mm. irresistibly to himself. So I had to surrender to to him, uh, to the Lord Jesus as my sovereign saviour mm. and king. Mm. And I'm very thankful for that. that yeah, God wow. did that. Mm. Amen. Fantastic. So we've been talking about these great truths of the Reformation uh, with reference to various people and events that happened. But for those of us who were perhaps asleep in history class, would any, either of you be able to give kind of like a, a sub five minute summary of this period that we're talking about, some of the key events and perhaps dates and people that were involved? Joshua, were you able to help us with that? No. Nope. <laughs> no, go on. But you've had a lot more experience in this area than I have. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the trouble. I don't teach church history, but yeah. here we go. Um, <clears throat> so the... The the period we're talking about is the 1500s. We're talking 1517, which is um, when Martin Luther nailed uh, the, his 95 theses, spelt with a T-H, to the door of the church in, in Wittenberg, um, which was primarily a actually a protest against the use of indulgences. And so this was under under medieval Catholicism, the church had departed so far from the faith, you had um, this idea of works of super irrigation, which was that the saints of the past had lived such um, holy and exemplary lives that they had done more good works than that was actually needed in order to enter heaven. Mm. And so the Pope, um, good on him, had managed to had a storehouse effectively had a store of those good works and so that's that, that that was the issue that provoked luther luther made a he made a pilgrimage to the vatican you know crawled up on his knees up the up the steps of saint peter's um the the cathedral there but was shocked and horrified at the profligacy the sinfulness that of the lives of the monks and of the priests and 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 so on and um luther of course he had he was an augustinian monk he had been grappling with these issues he had been really struggling with this concept of the righteousness of god for for luther as he read about the righteousness of god what that simply meant to him was condemnation god is a righteous judge and he was going to judge him and that that was his great battle um but he gradually came to understand that as Paul says in Romans, it's a righteousness of God by faith in Christ Jesus. So this idea of imputation, so that's what I mentioned in my talk, that <clears throat> the, the other big issue as well as scripture was the understanding of justification by faith because within Catholicism there was a conflation, a, a mixing up of the idea of justification and sanctification. Sanctification is when we become holy, right? We become, We die to sin, we live to righteousness. Um, within Catholicism, they, they confuse those two doctrines. They confuse sanctification and justification. And so even today, Catholicism teaches that justification is when God actually works actual holiness in us. Anyway, I have to back out of that little cul-de-sac because um, we could go down you know, for a long time. Sure. But anyway, so for Luther, th those were some of the key issues. So when he saw the abuses, he took that action. That kick-started something in the minds of, of not only the other um, churchmen, but some of the, the civil rulers, the, um, who, what was his name, the, one of the princes of, of uh, German princes. I can't, gone off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> and, and so that awakened a whole mm. interest and awareness of the need to go back and see actually what the scriptures were saying mm. as opposed to what the church had been teaching. Yeah. And of course that began to spread. Um, Luther was able, he was after the diet of Worms where um, he was likely to have been um, taken prisoner and executed. He was actually kidnapped by his friends mm -hmm. and taken away to the castle with the name, which just escapes me. And there he began work on translating the New Testament into uh, into German, mm. and that was, of course, a, a significant moment uh, in the in the progress of the Reformation, and of course that spread. And you so you had people like Calvin as well, and Swingley in, in Switzerland, and and John Knox in in Scotland. Mm. Um, 
So really at the heart of it was these, these five solas, um, the awareness of Christ alone, through faith alone, um, by grace alone, um, scripture alone. What's the one I've forgotten? To the oh. glory of God alone. Pardon? To the glory of God alone. Ah, yes, yeah, solidarity, glory. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Cool. Oh, I mean, I think that was I think that was an excellent answer. Well done. Um, cool. I mean, that as as has been said as well, um, Luther was struck not just by the sins of the what he saw in Rome, but by his own inability, as hard as he would try, mm. to overcome his own sin. Mm. And the system of theological truth, so-called, expressed by the Roman Catholic Church, had proven in Luther's life to be so woefully inadequate. And so he started mm. really wrestling with the Book of Romans in particular and came to the conviction that um, man cannot save himself mm. uh, and we need another. And so Christ is not just a partial savior, but Christ needs to do a lot more than what the Roman Catholic Church had. Otherwise, there's no hope because... Martin Luther had tried it. Yep. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty amazing for, to, to read through those kinds of journeys. Mm. Um, so if the Reformation is about recapturing these truths of Scripture and of the New Testament, does that mean that for 1,500 years the church just was dead? What had happened there? How should we understand that? Jeff? You, sound, you look like you've got an answer. Oh, no, no. <laughs> just again, I'm like, oh, wish, yeah, I wish I would um, Alex Robinson here, he <laughs> church yeah. history. Uh, but um, no, the answer is no. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Logan mentioned Hus, mm. uh, sometimes referred to as a proto-reformer. Mm. And uh, so there were people like him who were answer asking these questions. Um, you had, who was before Tyndall? Who did the translation... English translation before Tyndall's translation. 1400s? 14, yeah. Wycliffe. Sorry? Wycliffe. Wycliffe, yeah. So you had people like that. Mm. So, yes, God had, God preserved his church. God had his faithful mm. people, just as he still does today within the Roman Catholic Church. He's still got mm. his, his people, believers. Um, but it was just very hard to see, and it was hidden under all of this... Um, traditions and additions and things that had been piled on over the centuries. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah. I, I think another thing to recognize here is that Christ church does stand and continue and the gates of hell do not overcome it. Mm. Um, and uh, the Roman Catholic church as it developed throughout 1500 years uh, was an awful lot more varied than they like to admit. Mm. Uh, so too with the Eastern Orthodox Church and the various other branches of so-called Christendom, uh, some of which we might look back uh, as minority groups and go, they seem pretty Protestant, actually. Mm. Uh, and yet the testimony is that the further away from the Word of God we get, the less familiar we are with it. I mean, it was another uh, catch cry of the Reformation was ad pontes, back to the sources. We need mm. to get back to the Scriptures. Mm. If we don't, we are lost. Um, so... Uh, and not just as a way of salvation, but who is the God that we recognize yeah. actually made the world? Mm. Um, what is the consequence of sin? We need definition here. We need detail here. So we can't just hash it. Um, and, and so give us the word of God. And where the church throughout that period of time turned back, even within the medieval church, um, there was some amazing material written uh, around the Crusades. You know, we, we think mm. of the Crusades as this one bad area yeah. in, the, in the church. I mean, atrocities were committed, but mm. some of the writings that were done around that period of time, very challenging and, and mm. helpful, I think, pastorally and, and in terms of our sanctification faith. So, yeah, I mean, that uh, it's not just 1,500 years of failure and then Protestants, great, mm. now we've got the mm. church. Mm. Um, no, Christ church started before the foundations of the world, not only in his mind um, and in the decisions of the Godhead, but in Adam and Eve. They were made the people of God and continued and was kept strong by his strong hand all the way through. Everyone he had determined before the foundation of the world that, that would be saved would be saved and would be kept secure and would learn of the truth and faith in Christ. So even though 
pre-New Testament, they knew him as the promised Messiah. Mm. I mean, this is the Ooh. this is the church, and and we need to draw an awful lot of confidence in that. Um, a reason why this is so important is because if you're witnessing to Roman Catholics, as I know some of you do, uh, if you're witnessing to Roman Catholics, they will continually try to make well, lots of points, but at least this. They will say the church was really solid before the Protestant Reformation. Mm. And the Protestant Reformation actually made an absolute mess. Look at all the denominations. You know, that's not the true church of Jesus Christ. The true church is you know, one foundation, right? Mm. Um, so we follow the Pope. And the Pope tells us what to do, and we trust him. Like, well, yeah, okay. It's not as straightforward as you think it is. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah no, it, I, I totally agree. It's, the, the, church, the Catholic Church has, has and is uh, very, very, there's mm -hmm. a lot of difference of flavor. And even the whole 1500 years thing I would reject because, you know, the first Pope, Pope Gregory, he rejected that idea. Mm. He, he, he said, don't call me a Pope. Don't call <laughs> me the, you know, the, the first amongst all my brothers um so yeah it's 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 not as if there was the roman catholic church and then suddenly there were the protestants if we go, if we sort of take that tack then you fall into the danger of of prophetic movements like the the mormons mm. where the mormons say oh we 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 um you know we've brought the true truth back yeah um to the world so. mm. yeah thanks that's really helpful um you mentioned going back to the source, and we've got quite a few questions here about that and about, I guess, uh, Jeff, you mentioned autographs in your talk. Um, and we know that, you know, the Bible was originally written in Hebrew and in Greek. So are the Bibles that we have in English, are they really the word of God? What did the reformers think about translating the Bible? <coughs> Gutenberg <first. laughs> Uh, so, so just start with the last question, for, uh, the last part of your question. Mm -hmm. The re reformers believed that it was vital and it was important because pe the um, people needed to have access to the Word of God, mm -hmm. and um, which the Roman Catholic Church was opposed to. They thought, saw it as something that was dangerous, um, that people should have the Bible in their own language and be able to read it for themselves and interpret it for themselves. So, so yes, the reformers definitely believed in translating the Bible into the the vulgar tongue, mm. the, the common tongue. And and also um, what was important was the re, um, a discovery or rediscovery of the importance of going back to the original languages. So you remember at the time of the Reformation, the main translation or the main Bible in use was um, Jerome's Vulgate, mm. and uh, which was a Latin okay. translation. And so it had its own issues and errors. Um, and so at the same time with the people like Erasmus, there was a rediscovery of the Greek text and the importance of going back to the Greek text and the, and the Hebrew text as well. So um, when you read the Confessions, and the Westminster Confession will say this, is that the Word of God, as it's in the original autographs, as, as it was originally penned, is, is the you know, inerrant and inspired Word of God. So what what about our English Bibles? Well, we have really good translations, but um, unlike the Quran, which in Islam where the Quran is almost has a divine status and Muhammad is simply the prophet, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is the incarnate Word of God, and the Bible is the is the Word of God written for us. And so, to have the Bible in translation, we have, we have great translations, and we should be very thankful for that. Mm, cool. You want to Just springboarding off that, go for it. There are also terrible blasphemous translations. Okay, um, tell us about that. And we we need to be careful because not everything that calls itself a sheep is a sheep. Not everything mm. that calls itself a Bible is a Christian Bible. Um, it, it, recognizing that we were delivered uh, the scriptures in Greek and Hebrew. And that is the inspired word of God. And we value that as the inspired word of God. It's sufficient for teaching, preaching, proof that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. You know, <laughs> we have a very high value placed on this. Then we should equally have a high value on as accurate translations as we can have. And when we turn around uh, as the Christian church and say to the world, it really doesn't matter as long as you're in the ballpark. And in fact, these paraphrased translations 
um, are more helpful for you because they'll meet you at your level. Then we get back to what I was speaking about in talk four. Um, it's not the paraphrase or, or uh, children's Bibles, uh, you know, that, that they're sinful in and of themselves necessarily. But the danger is for the church that the vast majority of people will think that they are equal in authority to a proper translation, an accurate translation of the word of God. And so we need to have an appetite for the truth that transcends ease. You know, mm. it can be easy to get something which is written for a 12-year-old and we're like, well, I was never a reader in the first place, so I'll just use that for my devotions. No, hang on a second. Uh, you will miss a lot. Mm. Um, go back as much as you can to the accurate versions that you have. And like you said, you're quite right. We have some very, very, we can have a lot of confidence in the, the modern translations that we have. But be careful. You know, there are there are a lot that you should stay away from. Mm. Mm. Go ahead. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, question for Logan, who's not here, but I'm sure you guys can help out with this. In his talk, Logan talked about a system of theology. Um, so when we talk about reformed theology, what, what do we mean? What do we mean when we say we're reformed Christians? What are some of the distinctives or how would you describe it? Um. Uh, I, I, in my membership courses that I run uh, in New Plymouth, I tend to say that there are actually quite a few different ways to describe what reform stands for. <laughs> um, they all overlap. They're all interrelated. Um, I normally start with saying that um, ultimately the Reformation was uh, a desire to get back to the Word of God. So I talk about ad fontes, um, and so we hold a very high priority for that. That's what the reform, mm. that is the authority, right? So if the Word says it, it must be so, and we're going to submit to it. Uh, but then we also talk about uh, tulip, uh, thanks to the Dutch. Um, so uh, total depravity and um, uh, unconditional election, so on and so forth. Uh, and then uh, we talk about the solas. And so I said, you know, these are these are various mm. ways that reformed people will describe their faith, mm. uh, and we'll talk our way through those different kinds of points, uh, great truths of, of grace, great pillars of grace. Um, but I tend to avoid, it, you know, there's a truth to it, but I tend to avoid simply tying this into 1500s um, because as much as the Reformation occurred in space and time, we're reformers not because of what the reformers did, but of the truths that Christ gave his church that we might become more like him. And those truths were delivered well before 1500s. Yep. <laughs> so that, that was being restored to us. Mm. But there are ref reformations, just like there were a number of Pentecosts. There, there were reformations throughout our history. I mean, there, there's been reformations in this country, um, certainly over in Europe and so on and so mm. forth. So, yeah, to just tie it into one event is something mm. that I kind of tend to step back from. Yeah. yeah. Do you anything to add to that, Jeff? Uh, maybe just with my... Um, Grace Theological College hat on. We are a Reformed Theological College, mm. and so the way that we define that is through the confessions. Mm. And so um, the confessions are for us like a fence that defines the the parameters of what for us is acceptable and not acceptable. So in order to be a board member or a trustee or to teach. Um, you need to be able to subscribe to that system of doctrine contained within the confession. Mm. Just the same as for my ordination vows, I have to be promised to subscribe to that system of doctrine contained in the Westminster Confession. Mm. Now, that's not to every jot and tittle of the Westminster Confession, but to that system, that the reformed system of doctrine as the confession holds that. And I, would, and I think it, it is really important, as Joshua was saying, that we are able to show people from the scriptures that this is not just a, a reformed idea, something that's scholastical, but rather that is biblical. Mm. This is biblical truth. Yep. Yeah. And if people want to investigate those um, confessions, what, what are we talking about? What, what are they called? Well, it's easier for me. I've only got the one, which is the Westminster Confession. I have faith. four. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some of them are a little bit harder to read, but Westminster Confession is a fantastic confession. Great place to start. Belgic Confession, Canons cool. of Dort, uh, which really deals with tulip. Mm. 
Um, and then uh, the Heidelberg Catechism is another confession we subscribe to as a church. And like I said earlier, not only is question and answer one, what is your only comfort in life and in death? Uh, amazing. Uh, evangelistically, it's amazing, mm. let alone to comfort us when we're struggling. Um, but just these kinds of things to be able to, to have ready answers for people without having to trawl all your way through your Bible and mm. go, okay, where do I find mm. the answer to that question? Right. Yeah. So, and you can find something that's been studied well and it's got the Bible references and you can look at it further. Mm. Um, it's a, just a very good place to start. Yeah, so, yep. and, and if you're Baptist, the London Baptist, Baptist yeah, sixteen eighty nine. Yeah, yep. cool. Thanks, um, Joshua. In your first talk, the second point, you said that God's law is His own attributes described. Could you perhaps expand on that statement? And someone is asking, where did this come from? Did you make it up? Sounds pretty good. <laughs> but God's law is His own attributes described. What do you mean by that? What does that mean? Uh, it, it, read Arcee Sprawl. Um, we'll listen to him. Uh, the, the, the amazing thing about God's law is that uh, it expresses in the script, I mean, you, Psalm 119, Psalm 19, lots of different places like this. It talks about what God is like expressed for man. Um, what, is, what should man pursue being made in the image of God that is holy and righteous and lawful and mm. what is not? God himself necessarily lives in accordance to his law. And so when we think about what he's revealed to man about the standard by which we live or die, and which we face judgment or not, um, we recognize that God's law is not arbitrary. I'm talking about his moral laws centrally. Mm -hmm. It's not arbitrary. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's an expression of uh, his own righteousness. Mm -hmm. Um, we, when we detach it from his own righteousness, I think we really struggle uh, to avoid one legalism, but also struggle to avoid passages like, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Why? Because his mm -hmm. commandments are an expression of what he loves. Yeah. Um, and he is what he loves in that, in that sense as well. Um, so, yeah. Mm. Does that answer the question? I think so. That's really helpful. Jeff, a question for you from your talk. Um, you, you talked about... Um, <laughs> that it's God who, who is the one who finds us and who draws us in. Someone asks, though, what about passages like Jeremiah 29, 13, where it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So how do we understand these passages that almost sound like they contradict that? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think it, I, I still think it's both and. I, mm. we, I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe that God effectually calls us to himself by his spirit and um, that was one of the things i would love to have talked about a bit more in my talk was not only does the spirit inspire scripture but the spirit helps us uh, illuminates our minds to mm. to understand and receive scripture um but we know that god does call us to himself god does seek and save the lost and we have those parables that jesus of the lost coin and the lost son um, and the lost sheep that, that the shepherd goes and finds. So, so God does call us, but also, yeah, he, he commands us to um, seek for him. Augustine had this interesting phrase, which is very famous, which is, Lord, command what thou wilt and will what thou dost command. So it was, Lord, you command what you want me to do and give me the willingness, give me the desire to do what you are commanding me to do. Mm. And that in many ways sums up our relationship with God. God, mm. God reveals himself in his, his, his law, his, his decrees. Uh, we, by our fallen human sinful nature, we, we rebel against that, we don't by nature want that until the spirit of God awakens in us that desire um, where, and, and so you think of the Philippian jailer, <laughs> what was it? It was an earthquake in the middle of the night and the prison door had been open. And so the spirit of God worked in that man's heart and he comes mm. in and he's like, save me. Yep. Um, and so I would say that with Jeremiah passage is, we are to seek God, and yes, but that is God at work in us. Mm. That is the Spirit mm. of God awakening that awareness of our need. And and I, 
coming back to my own personal experience, that was something that God brought me to the point of saying, Lord, I am lost, save me, mm. help me. Um, up until that point, I'd been resisting and trying to ignore God. But at that moment, God made me cry out to him. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Joshua, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I just got to say, I mean, it, it, even as you say that, you'd recognize that God had chosen you from before the foundation of the world. Mm. And so your it, the evidence of faith now in your heart as you cried out to the Lord, you look back on, I'm, I'm sure, and, and would recognize that even that cry out is evidence of what God has chosen to do in your life that you now recognize <laughs> rather than, okay, now I have the option. Will I walk through the door? Will I not walk through the door? I guess part of the reason this is so important, guys, is a lot of people will use that passage in Revelation, you know, to stand at the door and knock, you know, and say, yeah. if you open it, then I'll be able to go in. And so, yeah. Like actually Christ is speaking to the Christian church there. Mm. Um, and, and when you realize that, it's patently obvious that he can't be speaking to an unbeliever who hasn't yet become converted. He's speaking to a people that desperately need to realize that they are denying the very Christ of their mm. salvation. Mm. And they need to be fellowshipping with the one that loves them and has expressed his love for them Yeah. Um, rather than trying to hold them at arm's length because they mm. think they'll be better off without mm. him. So, you know, it's those kinds of things. Ephesians 2 is very, very clear. Now, I tried to labor this in that fourth talk, uh, that no man can boast. Mm. We need to make much of the glory of God unapologetically. And uh, yes, this is a difficult truth. It's a difficult doctrine. And we need to wrestle with it. Mm. We don't just take the easy route. Um, but we do need to be careful to not undermine those other passages as well. Um, yeah. Mm. Josh, that connects really well with this next question. Um, you're talking about the the gospel is, you know, has all these hurdles, I guess, that um, people can't overcome by themselves. We need God's grace to be able to do that. But when we do become Christians, then it's good news. Someone asked, well, how do we not take that for granted? How can we um, continue to hold this gospel as good news as we proclaim it to each other, to other Christians as well? Any thoughts on that? Look, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, I think <laughs> the, the, the very basic answer is, you need to know the gospel mm. and not just know it yourself, but to live it out in the lives of your Christian community. You are called by God to build one another up into Christ the head. You, you're not going to be able to do that well if you're not passionate about the good news of salvation by grace alone and through faith alone in Christ alone. Um, but it's, it's staggering to me how we as believers are so weak that we come and we, we go to a Bible study, we do our devotions, and yet so few of us are able to remember the great truths of the scriptures sufficiently to then, in any semblance of passion, speak to other people an hour later about what we've been engaging with. Mm, <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's, it's easy enough when we come to church and, and we've got a ready audience, perhaps. Um, but generally speaking, I, I mean, the, if if... These kinds of things are true, what we've been professing, which they are, then that's transformative. Mm. It's the kind of love that cannot be hidden, must not be hidden. And the devil wants us to hide it. Our sinful nature wants us to hide it. And that's part of the battlefield, right? Now, now our spiritual, we battle against spiritual forces in the heavenly places. We battle in relation to our own sinful heart. Um, but know the truth and speak the truth. Talk to people about the gospel. After church services, make a habit not of going, let's catch up with these people about their work situation as much as there's a place for that. Instead, talk to them about what Christ has just shown you out of the word. Mm. Celebrate it. Seek to learn and to grow and to build one another up spiritually through that. You know, maybe we need to read things together. Maybe I can disciple someone in relation to this kind of thing. But we need to change our attitude towards these things. We're still very much, I think, Sunday Christians or private mm. closet Christians. Um, this is an emotionalism, so don't misunderstand me, but this is still very much a, if, that, if, 
it's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. Mm. Um, mm. And may the zeal for his house consume me. Yep. Yeah. Pray about it. Yeah. That's great. I think it's very practical, really helpful. Jeff, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I wonder, thinking about how practical that is, to be thinking about, well, what is it that God has impressed upon our hearts? What are some things that even today, as you've listened to each other and had conversations with people, have there been things that you have uh, had Christ the Lord impress upon you today out of this time together? Uh, yeah, really... well, look, I, 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 I very much enjoyed um, well, both well, all the talks today. Um, Putting my one aside. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, Logan. Um, Came at the right time. He was just saying he enjoyed your talks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, look, I, I really appreciated just uh, Josh Josh's Joshua's last talk about um, the, the, these barriers to the gospel um, and how. Uh, just a reminder for me how so much of that lies within my own self. Mm. Uh, a sense of timidity. I think just, you know, coming back to what Joshua was talking about before in, in relation to the sovereignty of God and salvation and and uh, that God is the one who is electing it to himself, his people, and is working out salvation. Of all, of all Christians, we Reformed Christians should be the most confident and mm. bold mm. with the gospel. Yeah, amen. Um, it's a crazy thing, that, and yet we're so often timid and shy. So that's been a challenge for me, just, you know, uh, thinking about like the balance of, of friendship and, and mm. gospel boldness, um, that thinking of my neighbors and mates that I've, I've developed relationships with and people that I've talked to and, yeah, how it is so easy. It's easy to go that first step, but it's hard to go that next step sure. yeah. and introduce gospel into that. And so I think for me, the one way I know I can do that is through questions asking people mm. questions which surfaces that topic and then you can talk into that topic. But yeah, I, I was I appreciated that that challenge. Yeah. Mm, that's cool. Um, now that Logan's here, might send some of the questions that we had for him uh, his way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Don't you yeah. want me to talk about how amazing Jeff's talk was? <laughs> I mean, uh, we'd love to. Taking that opportunity away from... <laughs> <laughs> we'll, hear, we'll hear about that later on. Um, but uh, Logan, we had a, a few questions about, you, you had that analogy of the, the microscope and the telescope, and we wanted to think through how that works. Um, so what, one question about that is, do we magnify God like a telescope because he's far away? Is that part of it? Um, no. So, yeah, so we're on? Yeah. So it's not so much that we magnify him like a telescope because he's far away, it's just purely a helpful illustration to help us think through the fact that he is big and glorious. He is glorified. He is glory as opposed to he's actually small and we need to make him bigger. Mm -hmm. So I guess that would be where the illustration breaks down. The problem is not that God's glory is far away and we have to bring it near. Because what, Isaiah 6, the whole earth is filled with my what? Glory. Glory. Yeah, so his glory is here. It's manifested mm. everywhere. Our job as we glorify him is to make that glory shine and seek to live, in our, live our lives in such a way that his glory is manifested even brighter so that people mm. might look at us and look at our churches and see God's glory. Cool. Thanks. That's really helpful. Clear that up. Could, could I just make a brief comment in relation to that? Please do. Um, one of the things that's staggering to me about the story of Moses is here's a man who... Uh, recognizing the wickedness of his people, stands before God, and he actually asks God, show me your glory. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we look at that and we, we take a big step back and we look at all of Scripture and we say, oh, you know, like God says to Moses, Moses should have known better. No man can see God's glory and live. Uh, you know, we got to be his president. Why is Moses even asking that? Yep. And yet God doesn't say no. Mm -hmm. He hides him in the cleft of a rock and passes before him. And as a result of it, his face glows. Mm. And so there's one sense in which God is very imminent mm. and his glory fills the whole world. There's another sense in which God, uh, well, transcendent, um, but th there's another sense in which God needs to show his glory to and impress that glory upon us. And it's not that he's far away. It's that we, in our finiteness, 
have such squinty eyes. <laughs> like God open our eyes that we can perceive you more. Right. And mm. so we cry out to him for that. Yeah. And we need to attend ourselves to that. Um, rather than just uh, assuming everything's going to work out. No, show me your glory. We mm. need to pray those kinds mm. of prayers. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. The only other thing I'd add to that would also just be the reality of the um the fact that glory is not a substance, we often think of God's glory like, you know, like light, something that you could, let me see some something mystical to see your glory. Glory is an ethical character at the end of the day. That's why when God reveals himself, he doesn't say, look at my brilliance. But he says, I'm kind, merciful, compassionate, slow to anger. And so when Moses, sorry, when Isaiah is confronted with God's glory in Isaiah 6, why does he fall down and say, woe is me, I'm a sinner? It's not because he sees a really angry God. It's because he sees perfection. Mm. He sees perfect love, perfect kindness, perfect goodness, perfect cleanness. And he goes, wow, I'm nothing like that. And so that's one of the chief ways we actually magnify the glory of God is through godly character. Mm. Great. Thanks, guys. Jeff, I had a question for you here. Um, thinking about like solar scripture, someone asks, in your opinion, have we, the reformed spectrum of churches, is it possible that we've overemphasized the spoken or preached word of God from the pulpit, especially at the expense of things like the word of God as lived out and embodied in the sacraments, which is really emphasized in Roman Catholic and Orthodox circles, um, or perhaps in church life, or even in applying God's word in its entirety to every aspect of our lives. Any thoughts on, on that? Is it that's possible a, to overemphasize yeah. the, the word preached? That's, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I probably ha I haven't thought about it quite like that. I guess what I would, all I would say is that um, there is a misunderstanding of Sola Scriptura, which is it's understood as being the Bible alone and nothing else. Mm. Um, I, the only place I've encountered that was in a cult when I was a young Christian, I started hanging out with some cult people called the Cooneyites. And I remember I was sitting in the lounge of this house and I said, oh, I've been reading this great book by R.C. Sproul. Uh, and I said, have you guys read that? Or And there was, I mentioned something by Spurgeon and there was silence around the room. And everyone, until one of the older people spoke up and said, we don't read any other books except for the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> so so that that is not what solar scripture means mm. um solar scripture is that you ultimately you come back to the bible as you as as I said you put the you have these other things you have mm. reason tradition experience you have scripture but and the crown is on scripture everything yeah. else has to be submitted to scripture mm. um mm. yeah look at sacraments yeah the, the, there is a there is a visible reality in the sacraments yes no doubt about that and 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 I think that within some branches of Protestantism, there has been a downplaying mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. that, oh, it's just the emblems and we just do this um, as a, you know, just a very brief mm -hmm. thing. Whereas in the, for example, in the Lord's Supper, there is a, a there is a visible manifestation of the gospel and of the, the presence of Christ. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure these other guys want to say more. Any thoughts, other guys? No. No. <laughs> so it's, I, I, don't, I don't think we have a high enough view of the scripture. Mm, amen. Like, how, how many of us can truly say, my view of the scriptures is too strong and other areas of my life and worship are languishing because of it? The reality is, the higher of your view of the word of God, the higher you will hold the sacraments mm. because it's in the word of God that we find them. The higher your worship will be, the higher your submission you will be. The high, why? Because it's in the Word of God that all of these things are revealed to us. I think we have a pretty poor view of the sacraments, but I don't think that's because we've overemphasized other things. Mm. I think mm. it's just because we've got a weak view of the sacraments, mm. and we know we need to look into the Word of God and mm. really wrestle with what's going on in the real presence of Christ in communion, and be be led to worship, but that's going to happen by coming to the word, not by going to mystical experiences. That's really cool. Yeah. I'd, I'd say um, in relation to the question, mm. we don't have a high enough view of preaching either. Mm. 
I mean, stop and think for a moment what it means that the scriptures testify that Christ speaks through his mouthpiece mm. to his people, that we come to worship and Jesus is talking to you. You know, when, when the minister is, is accurately speaking the words of God, that's the, that's the language that the scriptures use in a variety of different places. So when our risen Lord is speaking to his beloved bride, washing her in the water of the word through preaching, can you really, you know, is that your view of preaching? Well, you know, so I think it's a struggle for most of us to really comprehend mm -hmm. the wonders of that. I think in, in contrast, though, uh, one of the areas which I think we really do fail with is a lack of familiarity with the scriptures for each of us individually. It's not just downplaying the um uh, the, the the preaching or the sacraments or any of these other means of grace. It's, well, hang on. It, so many Christians, brothers, you, you've probably found the same in, in pastoral ministry. So many Christians feel such a lack of confidence in life in terms of navigating things in wisdom. And you know, it's, oh, I just wish I knew more. And, and yet, how many of those same people who have crises of, crises of confidence spend significant amounts of time searching the scriptures, reading good material as an aid, and, and really studying just the depths and the riches of what we have been entrusted. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we do not love what God has given anywhere close to what we should. Mm -hmm. And in, in an age now where the average reading age is like 12 or 13, where the literacy age is dropping immensely, and especially for you men, uh, the the world is telling you that in actual fact, you don't really need to be literate at all to be a productive member of society. I've told a number of Christian schools uh, over the past years that one of the primary reasons that we teach our children to read is so that they can read the scriptures. And there was a guy uh, over in the States, um, he was a politician, and he was testifying of a friend of his, a black African-American guy, um, whose father used to every morning, sit there and open up this newspaper, uh, you know, over the breakfast. And sit there and he'd open up this newspaper and he'd, he'd spend time in front of it. And his son, and, and eating his breakfast and getting ready for school, you know, he'd see his father spending all this, you know, studying the newspaper. Anyway, guy would go off to school, come back. It was only many, many years later that he realized his dad couldn't even read. Hmm. And... His father had done this, his mum told him, because his father had died by this stage. His, mm. his mother told him his father was under such a conviction that he wanted more for his family than what he had had, mm. that education was so critically important, that he would even do that to try mm. and sh set an example for his son that he should be spending time studying these things, mm. uh, even though he didn't know how to read himself. And yet how much more as Christians, having been entrusted by the word of God, must we dig deeply mm. and hunger and mm. thirst after such things and then be well equipped? I mean, God tells us we'll be well equipped with the word, right? We heard that great talk by Jeff. Mm. Um, and, and we shouldn't be unfamiliar with these things. And you men in particular, the challenge is to you. You must never allow the excuse of, I'm just not really a reader, to interrupt the call that God has given to you to be heads of your households and to lead them uh, as soldiers in this world, soldiers of the faith. They need to be equipped, and God has given you to them, and you, he's given you the scriptures so that you can do it well uh, to disciple them. Mm. They need you. So don't forsake that calling. Mm. Fantastic. Well, we're coming to the end of our time. Well, yep, sure. We could... A quick one. All right. We do have one for Logan, which was um, you mentioned that Calvin would end his sermons talking about uh, calling people to prostrate themselves before God. What does that mean? Like literally, what does it mean? But also, how do we do that in church? Yeah. So he's, I don't think, uh, I can't find any historical evidence to say that he's actually asking everyone to prostrate themselves, like bow themselves down on the ground, face first or something like that. I think it's ultimately an attitude of spirit and heart that would willingly, I just want to keep using the words like bow down, that what is willing to submit yourself mm. to whatever God decides is best for your life, as long as he is glorified. 
It's a, it's an attitude, and that's why it's always mingled in with that is this call to humility, because he because he's recognizing that we are very small and he is very big. And our one response to God is always the same. It's the Isaiah response, right? Mm. Woe is me. Woe is me. Cool. Thanks. That's great. Well, this has been a great conversation and it's been a great day. Uh, if people are wanting to learn more, more about the Reformation, perhaps its history, the biographies, um, the theology, where can people go to get more information and resources on that? Where do we go from here? Oh, I know. <laughs> they could enroll at Grace Theological College. Wow, tell us more about that. That would go into our GTC discussion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, GTC yeah. is great. There's some great stuff. Sign up for a paper. It's cheap as chips. It's almost midday burglary. <laughs> uh, order a paper. They're all at nighttime, so you can do it when you're not at work. You can do them by distance. So there is literally no excuse for you not to sign up for a GTC paper when you get home. Hmm. Uh, so expect Ortner. Um, that's a blessing. In another place, website, Ligonier. Go to Ligonier.com. Just Google it. If you can't find it, tell me. I'll show you. They've got a hmm. million good resources on this stuff. And other than that, read the Bible. Great. Any other thoughts, Joshua? Uh Go to church. Yep. Sit under faithful preaching. Mm. If your if your preachers in your churches do not have two worship services, ask the preacher to do a second worship service on a Sunday. I think it's a it's a terrible indictment on the appetite of the church uh, for their God that we have on average dropped down to one or less services on average. Mm. Come into the presence of God and learn of His Word. You know that that's. Talk about re Reformation, Reform theology. That's what they fought for. That's mm. what they died mm. for, that we would have these things. That the, the pages of your Bible are saturated in the blood of the saints. Mm. So wow. if you're going to learn, if you're going to honor the memory of those who fought and died for the faith, including Christ, and celebrate his work, spend time in the word and learn of him. Uh, mm. Pray that God will uh, send his spirit and gather together not just in church for hearing the preaching of the word and Bible studies, uh, book groups, ask for help from other leaders, godly men in your congregation, mm. uh, young women, seek out older women in the congregation, ask for mentorship. Mm. I mean, read Titus too. Older women teach the younger. God has given us so much that there's really a glut in the market for spiritual growth and development, God's means of grace. Uh, you, you just need to go, yep, I'll, I'll make use of that. But <laughs> there's so much material. God yeah, has been so good to us. That's fantastic. Well, thank you, men, for your answers and for your talks today. We've um, really been blessed by what you've brought to us. Well, we are going to sing our final songs for the day before we break. So we're going to quickly rearrange the stage um, before we sing. Hello, hello. Thanks, everybody, for your talks. Just while the others are coming up, I just want to read these verses from Romans chapter 11. After all, those weighty doctrines that Paul, Paul went, goes through in Romans, he breaks out into this doxology, which I've just lost. Here we go. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen.